Pastor Damon and us here at Dynamic Life Baptist Ministries. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your commitment. We just praise the Lord for the opportunity to be of service to you uh, by sharing with the Word of God with you for a brief moment tonight. First of all, I want to start off by thanking my dear brother, Marcus Robinson, for filling in the last couple of Wednesdays and, and doing a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful job. We pray that you were blessed by his teachings. Uh, that's just what we did here at Dynamic Life. We try to equip people, prepare people, and serve at all times. And we just thank my dear brother for filling in. And you will be seeing him more in the future. He doesn't know that yet, but he, <laughs> he now knows it. And, uh, he's going to spread the wealth. And we just praise the Lord for the opportunity. Uh, my uh, continuation of our study in the Revelations, but uh, due to my spending some time with my Lord and Savior up on the mountain, with him, the Holy Spirit, Moses, Jesus, and all the other prophets and apostles uh, who are gone, I really felt like that we as a church uh, have been drifting away from our Wednesday night prayer time. And so I wanted to kind of rekindle that because I believe prayer is vitally important to the sustainability of our country, to the sustainability of our homes, to the sustainability of our marriages, our churches, leadership, so on and so forth. And we all know we're living in um, troubling times, uh, turbulent times. Um, we, we have lost the ability as a nation and as a people and as churches to know up from down, right from left, right from wrong. And, and so I believe we need to, as a church, return to um, prayer and to focus on prayer. Uh, so tonight, I just want to spend some time in prayer, if you all don't mind. Uh, we're just going to be looking at a couple of passages that give us some insight and direction on prayer. We're going to, I'm going to lead us in that prayer from a pastoral perspective, and then we will pick up on our study next Wednesday if the Lord decides not to have another uh, interruption to our current program. Uh, so if you are turning your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, I'd like to start there. Daniel chapter 9, that's in the Old Testament. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 reads as follows. Uh, in the first year of Darius, the son of Azarias, of the lineage of the Medes, who were made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seven years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Verse 3 says, Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy, with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by, by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded, verse 6 says, your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries in which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which has, they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God, verse 9, belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law, and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges, and who judge us by bringing upon us great disaster. 
for under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. Verse 13 says, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he has done, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. We'll just stop right there. You can read the rest of that passage on your own. Uh, whether we agree or not, whether we believe it or not, and different pastors and world leaders will try to share why we are in the shape we are in and come from different points of view. But I think Daniel makes it absolutely clear that our disobedience has brought us to where we are as a nation. The people of God have been disobedient to the precepts and judgment of God. We have compromised, and we're talking about the compromising church in Revelation, but we have compromised with the, and capitulated and come alongside the culture, and we don't know right from left, right from wrong anymore. And much like the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 18 and following, we are condoning that which we used to call sin. And what our nation used to call sin is now being condoned and laws are being passed and Christians are agreeing on both sides. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, we are in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, I believe. And we need to pray our way out. We need to come humbly. That's what that illustrates. To put on sackcloth and ashes means that you understand your poverty before God. And it illustrates humility before God. We are such a prideful nation, and we have a lot to be thankful for, but not much to be prideful about, because we really have nothing to do with the fact that God has blessed us for all these years of formation. But the blessings have turned into pride, and the pride has brought about the cursing. But today in the modern day church, we don't believe much in being cursed by God. We believe that we can live any way we want to live and do anything we want to do and act any way we want to act. And grace, grace will cover us. Yes, grace does cover our sins. And yes, God is a forgiving God. Daniel admits that in the text. But God is still a God of righteousness. He does expect his people to live righteously before him and before those who do not know his name who have not yet bowed the knee to his name. But there is so much that I could tell you about what's going on in the church behind the curtains that would just mesmerize you and, and blow your minds that you may not be aware of. Decisions that are being made by some of the largest uh, Christian denominations in our country that are so contrary to the word of God that God has to do something to get the church's attention. And I believe we are at that point. We are at a pivotal point uh, with our government, an election is coming up, and uh, Christian people don't even know what to vote, let alone who to vote for. We don't really understand what God stands for, what God stands against, and if we are aware of what God stands for and what God stands against, we don't really care because we want what we want. We want our comforts. We want our rights, and and, and, and those things have a place. Please don't misunderstand me. But when you start to vote for people who oppose the very things that God stands for, who oppose very clearly, unashamedly, remember the text says, we have no shame in the world. We have no shame about sin. And he's talking about his people. He's not talking about the people or not his people. We, his people, no longer have shame or nor are we ashamed of the sin that we used to be ashamed of. And so therefore, tonight, I want us as a church, I don't know about all the other churches, I don't know, not listening, 
But I would challenge you, and I would challenge myself, and I would challenge all of us to lay ourselves before God with humility and do what Daniel has done so far in this text that we have read and confess our sin as a nation and as churches, as the people of God, and repent and turn so that God can once again open up the windows of heaven and pour out his blessing, not only on our nation, but his people. You see, there's something about when you are right with God, that even when God is disciplining the nation or disciplining his children, you have strength even in the midst of the, the discipline. You're all right because God is holding you up, building you up, sustaining you all around you among the other people. And so therefore, God does not promise us not to sometimes get caught up in the spanking. You remember when you were a kid and, and, and one child got in trouble? Everybody was in trouble. <laughs> and so sometimes we can get caught up even when we're doing what is right, uh, much like Daniel, but be caught up in God disciplining, disciplining the whole nation. And I believe that's where we are. And that doesn't mean that every church and all churches are guilty of, of condoning that which God does not condone, of not standing for what is righteous. But I believe there has been enough going on for so long that God is judging the whole and the rest of us may be caught up in the mix. And I believe that one of the ways that we appease God's wrath, one of the ways that we can satisfy God's wrath is that we must pray what Daniel prayed in this text, a prayer of repentance modeled by humility confessing the sin and getting right with our God. So let me lead us in this prayer. I have a couple other sections I want to look at, but I want to pray for our nation. I want to pray for our churches. I want to pray for our Christian homes. I want to pray for Christianity as a whole because as Daniel models here, until we return to the judgments, the precepts, which simply re represents the word of God, is clearly communicated in the scriptures, then we are facing the judgment of God rather than receiving the blessings of God. So I want our church to be one of the leaders in this prayer movement, if you want to call it that, in this prayer mindset that calls out to God and confesses to God and begs his forgiveness and pleads for his mercy. I want to do the joint Daniel and others prophets who have prayed these kind of prayers because we're the only people that can get God's attention. So let it start here in 1916 Central with us. Amen. So if you'll bow your hair and heads, we'll pray. Most merciful Father, we have read through Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 through 15 and we have heard the voice of the Lord. I have heard the voice of the Lord and I pray that those who have read the passage with me and have heard the passage read to them, have heard your voice. For you speak through your word. And you don't change. You are the eternal God. You are the everlasting God. You are the God who doesn't change. And what you consider sin, even when Daniel was praying, you still consider sin today. And I must confess, Father, that we as a nation have left your precepts and your judgments. I must confess, Father, that we have built ourselves up in pride and we have taken credit for your blessing and call it American pride and ingenuity. We have forgotten that you allow us to get up, that you are the God who is in charge of our uprising as well as the God who can be in charge of our downcasting. Forgive us, Father, for taking credit where you deserve all the credit. Forgive us for being a nation of glory robbers, stealing your glory, stealing your praise, stealing your honor and taking it on for ourselves, boasting to other nations about who we are, not realizing we are only what we are because of the grace and the mercy of the Almighty God. I too, like Daniel, confess that we as a nation, we as your people, 
have sinned against you. That the church is guilty of compromising and capitulating with the culture far too much. We are divided over political lines. And we don't stand for what the kingdom stands for. We stand for what the political party stands for. So much so, we are blinded by lack of character. And we really don't peer behind the screen to see what the man or woman really stands for. And whether what they stand for supports what you stand for or is against what you stand for. Your word is clear where we should stand on life in the womb. Your word is clear where we should stand on life in the tomb. Your word is clear where we should stand on life in between the womb, on the way to the tomb. Your word is clear about whether you made other gender options or you've only made two. Your word is clear that your people are to be a holy people, a righteous people, that your church is to be a house of prayer and unity and not divided. But yet your church here in America is divided over political party lines, over ethnic and cultural issues. We have segregated that which you have unified by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to come before you on behalf of this church, and behalf of our nation, and behalf of all the churches that are existed that belong to you, and confess like Daniel did, we have sinned. We have left your precepts, we have left your judgments. We have not listened to your prophets, your pastors, your preachers who are saying what you would say if you were here yourself. We are not measuring the voices that are speaking, claiming to speak in your name according to what you have already said. We're taking surveys, we're publishing polls, but we are not searching the scriptures and we are not being searched by the scriptures. And I'm asking you, Father, on behalf, I'm standing in the place of your people and say, forgive us. Forgive us. We confess that we have sinned. We lay ourselves before you in humility. While we do not physically put on sackcloth and ashes, in our hearts we are humbling ourselves before you this evening and asking you for mercy. Our nation is in trouble. Our nation is at a crossroads. There is no guarantee that America will always exist. But there's definitely a guarantee if we do not keep you at the forefront of the nation that we shall not exist for long. You have been merciful. You have been gracious. You've given bountiful fruit and pleasure to us as a nation. Much like Israel you have blessed us like Israel, but much like Israel, we have turned our backs on you. Your churches have not become houses of prayer. They have become houses of entertainment, of false teaching, of unsound doctrines, of loose lips and lapsing hearts. Your churches have become filled with people who worship with their lips, but their hearts are far from you. Holiness no longer reigns in the household of God. It is not even on the lips of the people of God any longer. May we return. May we return like Israel returned. And found restore, restoring and restoration and strength and freedom and liberty from those that you put it in captivity to because they did repent. They did return. Therefore, you did restore them. Restore us as a nation. Start in the church house before you start in the White House. If we can ever get the church house right, maybe you'll get the White House right. If you could ever get the homes of those who profess to be Christians right, maybe you can get the homes of those who are in the entertainment sector right. Start with your people first, Father. And let it overflow into the nation. Let it flood the nations. Start with your people. Fill us. 
and let it become a flood that overshadows the sin, the wretchedness, the unrighteousness, the disobedience of our nation. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. There's so much more we could say. But we lay this before you with humble hearts, with grateful hearts, with blessed hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that's the first prayer that I thought was vitally important for us to pray. And now I'd like to go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Many of you who know me that know that the unity of the church, the unity of the church across ethnic lines and across cultural lines and across class lines it is vitally important because I believe, based on scripture, it's vitally important to God, the Father and God, the Son and God, the Holy Spirit. But the church is disunified over far too many issues that God never meant for it to be divided on. Satan is the enemy of unity. And he is doing a wonderful job of keeping us segregated. What Martin Luther King said all those years ago, back in the 60s, is still true today. 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour in America when it comes to the church. It's not segregated when it comes to the football stadiums or the baseball stadiums or the basketball arena. It's segregated when it comes to the household of God. For you will find those places filled with all kinds of people from different ethnic backgrounds, different class levels, and different cultural backgrounds. But in the household of God, we're segregated. And I'm here to say to you this evening, until we acknowledge that it's sin before an almighty, all-holy God, and we repent then God's blessing cannot flow through this house the way he wants it to flow. So read with me John 17, if you will, starting at verse 20 through 26. Jesus prays for all the believers of all time, but specifically in this context, he prays for believers that are going to believe as a result of the apostles fulfilling the Great Commission. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. One, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. There, there is the definition of the unity. There is the picture of the unity that Jesus describes that we, as the body of Christ, should be modeled. I in you, that they may also be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. The unity of the church, not sameness. God is not asking us to be the same, but there's unity and diversity, and there's diversity within the unity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in the Godhead, but they're separate, equal persons. Unity and diversity is even in the Godhead. And it's built into creation all the way back to Genesis to the end of Revelation. Therefore, if Christ died and everything he's saying here in his prayer is a result of his dying, being buried, and having been risen, and ascending to the right hand of the Father to be the mediator between God and man. But not only the mediator between God and man, but also the mediator in the church, <coughs> along with the Holy Spirit interceding on behalf of the church, making prayers and petition on behalf of the church in the heavenly realm where our citizenship is to be found. He goes on to pray, verse 21, that they, that they all may be one. Now, last time I checked, all means all. Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodists, all who have the common faith, all who have been saved by faith through grace, with the object being Jesus Christ. Listen, if you have that in common with me, we are brothers and sisters forever. 
and ever, and ever, and add a trillion more ever. Amen. That doesn't start when we get to heaven. That starts while we live here on earth. The picture that he's painting here is not just the heavenly unity we will have when we gather around the throne in Revelation 5 and 7, but the earthly unity we have to massage out and practice mm -hmm. and fight for mm -hmm. and hold on for. Mm -hmm. And as Ephesians chapter 4 says, preserve in the bond of peace. Mm -hmm. Jesus died to make this kind of unity possible with people who can never be unified apart from him. And for our churches, hear me now, to be violating that unity over preference issues, style issues, cultural issues that have nothing to do with doctrine issues is an affront to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it needs to be confessed it needs to be turned from. It needs to be put out the church with the garbage. Mm -hmm. And so he continues to pray that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. This is why we're being ineffective in, in evangelism in America. He ties the world believing the gospel, the good news, the message of salvation to the oneness, the unity of the Christians. We're trying to tell the world and we're trying to march with the world and protest with the world about injustice and we don't even have unity right in the household of God. Mm. Amen. And if that offends your blackness, if that offends your whiteness, if that offends whatever you want to be offended by, read the text again. Don't just hear my words. Mm -hmm. See, we are, we are more worried about being offended as human beings than we are about offending God. Mm -hmm. That's backwards. If we could ever get people's hearts, if I could ever get my heart to be convicted by my offense of God, then maybe I can get right with my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Verse 22 says, And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as thirty, just as we, capital W-E, referring to the Trinity, just as we are one. We're a reflection of that oneness in the body. Not just your local church, but the church on earth. How are we doing with that? Not good. Then I think we need to confess and repent of our sin for violating that. I in them and you in me. So he's in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. God the Father is in, in Christ. That they may be made perfect, complete, and one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and I love have loved them as you have loved me. And the love that he has shown us, this is in John 13, 34, and 35, they will know you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. What is that love? It's agape love. Mm -hmm. It's the same love that the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father and that the Father and the Son have for us. Mm -hmm. And we're to demonstrate that to one another. That's why we shared Sunday, there are over 30 positive and negative statements about one another, loving one another in the Bible. Mm -hmm. We don't love one another like the Father and Son loves one another and how they love us. Mm. Amen. See, 
This removes you and I coming up with my own definition of what love should look like. <laughs> you do not have to sing that song of that great philosophical group, Foreigner, I want to know what love is. Look at the Father, look at the Son, look at the Holy Spirit, look at the cross. Amen. Put your mind in heavenly places, get in the Bible, it's clearly illustrated and clearly defined. Mm -hmm. But can I tell you a little secret that you may not want to know? There are people in your church who are really not saved who can't love like this messing up the picture. Mm. There are public officials who are claiming they're Christians who are not really Christians messing up the picture. And because we live in a generation that does not discern things by the word of God, but by a Democratic or Republican or Tea Party platform or an ethnic makeup platform and not the word of God, we can no longer discern who's who and what's what. Mm. I think it was John MacArthur who said, one of the major missing links in our modern day churches and in the lives of those who profess to be Christian is the ability to discern the left from the right. Mm -hmm. The good from the bad. The better from the best. But if you know your Bibles in the book of Jonah, God told Jonah there's some people in Nineveh that have the same problem. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new under the sun. Now, the problem is you don't think you're the one who can't discern. But have you laid yourself before God like Daniel did and asked him what he thinks about your heart and your inward man? Have you gone to somebody who is doing it and asked them, how are you doing that? I've been watching you and I noticed that you don't respond like I respond, and you don't respond like other people respond, that you're loving some people that I just can't love. How are you doing that? Mm. And I guarantee you they will tell you about the power of God that you don't know by experience for yourself yet. You know information. You know what the Bible says. It's just not your reality. <coughs> And sin hinders that from being a reality in your life. Compromising with the world and the culture hinders that from being your reality. Mm -hmm. Trying to have one foot in the church and one foot out the church will hinder that from being your reality. Mm -hmm. A lack of a vibrant prayer life will hinder that from being your reality. A lack of a, of a vibrant study life in the word of God, a taking in and a taking out, a breathing in and a breathing out of the word of God will hinder that. Amen. But, you know, you're just trying to make it over to the other side. Mm -hmm. Or like the old folks used to say, and it's not good theology, you're just trying to climb up the rough side of the mountain, doing your best to make it in. No, Jesus puts you in. There is no work you can do to get in. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. Jesus prays that we will be with him. We, we, we saw that uh, last, last Sunday, Sunday's message, if you're paying attention, that, that we're, we're, we're striving, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, verse 11, 12, and 13, to live blameless and holy lives. Waiting for what? The coming, the rapture of our bodies and the church. We always have to live with a mindset that he's coming. When's the last time you've been driving down the street, just roll down your window to look up and see if he's coming? <laughs> But that, 
that should be your mindset. You should anticipate them like you're anticipating a family member coming through the door anytime who's been gone for a while. Mm. But you don't really know exactly what time they're going to come through the door. Mm -hmm. But you're always peeking out the window. You're always opening the door and looking out to see if they're there yet. Mm -hmm. And you know what we do when companies come. <coughs> That house, can I talk to you for a minute? That house has been filthy all for three months. <laughs> Trash everywhere, beds unmade, carpet unclean. But when you hear they come, but you don't know when they're going to be, I think you do some holy clean. <laughs> I think you clean up what's been messed up because now you're anticipating the coming. Y'all ain't praying to me. Uh -huh. Go ahead. <laughs> See, you and I will live blameless lives, strive to live blameless lives and holy lives if we were always anticipating the coming. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't let sin and world and compromise and worldliness and fleshly build up in our lives, our inner man, mm -hmm. if we were anticipating the coming. Mm -hmm. But if you don't think it's coming, if nobody's coming over, mm -hmm. and you used to being trashy and nasty and sloppy, then you continue to be what? Trashy, trashy. nasty, and, and sloppy. sloppy. This is what the Bible is getting at. And so when we have that desire to be with him, because he does have a desire to be with us, then he says in verse 25, O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I declare to them your name and will declare it that the, the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. The love. Did you catch that last part? Verse 26. And I have declared to them your name. I have made you known to them. And everything that goes with your name, what your name stands for. Mm. I've made it known to them. See some of y'all catching up. In three and a half years, I've made you and everything about your name known to them. Mm -hmm. And here we are, say, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 30 years, and we still don't know his name and everything that pertains to it. Mm. By my physical presence. Isn't that what one disciple said? Show us the Father. Jesus said, have you been with me so long? Mm -hmm. When you have seen me, I have made the Father known. Mm -hmm. Do you know Jesus like that? Mm -hmm. I mean, you personally, me personally, do you know Jesus like that? That you, when you see Jesus, you understand the Father. Mm -hmm. And everything that goes with his name, his character, his promises, his decrees, his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, mm -hmm. his eternality. I mean, come on, come on, come on, dear brothers and sisters, I'm pleading with you tonight. Do you really know? then why don't we pray to him? I said to you Sunday that I heard Alistair Beck say, and I think it's very uh, uh, apropos, very fitting. There is no power in prayer. There's power in the object of prayer. Mm -hmm. And God should be the object. We saw this in Daniel, and that's why I'm dealing with these texts. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit should be the object of our prayer. That's where our power, that's where our stability, that's where our sustainability lies. As much as I would love to be able to sustain you and make you stable, I can't. Mm -hmm. that, that's God's responsibility. That's the Father's mm -hmm. responsibility. That's the Son's responsibility. Now, I build you up by teaching you the truth about God. But me teaching you the truth about God don't mean you know him for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're just getting into what I know about him. Mm -hmm. Come on. 
But that's different than you knowing him for yourself. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we do God very often like we do movie stars. Mm -hmm. We know their character, we don't know the person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we can tell you all about their character, but you can't tell them anything about who they really are. Mm -hmm. And many people are that way with God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. So then you start making the character, the character they are on the movie screen, mm -hmm. but that's not really who they are, so you really don't know. Because mm -hmm. that character don't really even exist. Mm -hmm. That's entertainment. Amen. But that's what people want in entertaining God. They don't want real God. Mm -hmm. So when they're praying, they're not praying to the real God who has the power to do something. They're praying to the movie screen God mm -hmm. that they have conjured up in the figment of their own imagination. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, no, that's not what I revealed to you. That's not who I revealed to you. <laughs> Verse 26, and I have declared to them your name and declare it, that the love with which you love me, mm, that the love with which you love me may be in them. Mm. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. The love that the Father has loved the Son with, he is praying would be in all the believers to come. Is it in you? Is it in me? Then why are we so segregated? Mm -hmm. Why are we so disunified? Why are we allowing donkeys and elephants and teacups to separate us when Christ has unified us? Mm -hmm. And put in us the love that the Father loved him with. Something is wrong our churches. And the only reason something that's wrong with our churches, there's something wrong with the people who go to our churches and make up our churches. Mm -hmm. Shall we pray? Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we come before you once again in sackcloth and ashes, admitting to you that we are not really reflecting the unity in the church among the believers that Jesus prayed for. And not only did Jesus pray for it, Jesus could pray for it because he knew what his death, burial, and resurrection would accomplish. But we've allowed Satan, false teachers, false believers, this world system to infiltrate our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our souls, and cause us to live and practice Things that you never saved us to live and practice. Where is this love that the Father loves the Son with that he has put in us? That helps to bind the heart. That helps to bind the wounds of the broken. That helps to speak out against injustice and oppression. And make the church a place of refuge without compromising the standards of God's holiness and his word. Where is this unity that Jesus prays for here? Being consistently and habitually, because nobody does it perfectly, but consistently and habitually practiced in the church when it is gathered and in the church when it is scattered. So that the world may believe that the Father has sent the Son into the world to save sinners such as we. Oh, Father, I believe there is a power disruption on the line. Father, I believe that many of us are not really plugged into the socket. And therefore, your power doesn't flow and if we're plugged in, many of us don't have the power flowing because we have not paid the bill of obedience. So there's a disconnect on the line. 
Father, we need to come to the heavenly throne room. Confess that we haven't paid. Start paying so that you can reconnect. Your power. To our dead lives. Because we all have to confess. While we read this, we can't do this on our own. But you never asked us to. What you asked us to, to do is obey. What you've asked us to do is allow you to live through us. What you've asked us to do is to deny ourselves, die to ourselves, and dedicate ourselves daily. I pray, Father, that we adhere at 19th, 16th century. We'll reflect this kind of unity. when we're gathered and when we're scattered. Having said that, Father, we have brothers and sisters who are battling with sicknesses and because we are unified, when they hurt, we hurt. When they suffer, we suffer. When they rejoice, we rejoice. We pray for Brother Hugh Berkeley tonight that you will bring healing into his body. We love him. He's a valuable brother. He's a dear brother. We pray for his wife. I can't imagine what she is feeling not knowing how things will turn out with her husband. Not knowing whether her daughter or her may be susceptible. But I know that we serve a God that is more than able. I pray that you will minister to them and that they will see you and understand you and believe in you on a deeper level than they ever had as a result of this. Bring healing, Father. Strengthen my dear brother in his physical body. Give the doctors wisdom of how to treat him. But we know ultimately healing is in your hands. And we know that you're able. And we're trusting you to do what is right and righteous. We pray for Sister Martinez and she's on the back end, but we thank you for getting her through. You know she's a dear sister. She's a valuable cog in the wheel of what goes on around here, just like Brother Berkeley. Heal her, Father. Strengthen her in her soul, her inner person. May she know you and understand you in a much deeper, intimate way that she had and did not before this. I also must give praise to you, Father, because that's really the only two that we know about that have had to deal with any COVID issues. You have been good to Dynamic Life and Baptist Ministries family members. You have shown kindness. We say thank you. We do not take that for granted. We humble and lay ourselves before you and say, Father, we know where our blessings come from. We know where our protection comes from. We know. And we say thank you. I pray for churches all around this world, especially America. Because I believe the church in America is, a, is, a, is at a pivotal point. And if we don't get it, and get it soon, we have not seen the downward spiral our country can be in. But I pray, Father, that the church will repent. That holiness will get back on our lips. That righteousness will get back in our churches. That obedience will become the obedience that brings honor, glory, 
and pleasure to you. Father, more churches need to be praying like this. More Christians need to be praying like this. I'm all for study of the Bible, but I understand that prayer gets your attention. You are the object of our prayer. We pray this not just so we can be comfortable. We pray this so that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Father, for putting this on our hearts. And I pray that these prayers, are, the praying will not stop here, but that we'll go home with each of us. And we will breathe in prayer, and we will breathe out prayer. According to the scriptures, according to your will, according to your word. And as you do this, Father, will you bless your people? Will you sustain your people? Will you stabilize your people? Will you strengthen your people? and establish them and give them firm foundations and roots. We pray this in Jesus' name. If I may, just one more section and we'll get you out of here. Uh, second, First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. We have an election coming up. I don't know if you know that or not. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised we're shocked. But we do. We have an election coming up. And uh, uh, now, you got to be careful with media because every election they say is the most important election that we've ever had in our country. Um, but, but we as Christians play an important role here in America because we have a republic mm -hmm. and we have a system of government that allows us to have somewhat of a voice uh, and, and a choice. Granted, the choices, you know, uh, but I, I would challenge you to study the issues that that God stands for mm -hmm. and then see which of the candidates most line up with those standards. None of them do it perfectly. None of them are even close to being perfect. But who most aligns? With, with that which God says he will bless or he will judge. Mm. And the Bible is very clear on those issues. And so we need to vote for the candidate who most and best reflects those issues. And then pray for that person. See, one of the things I've learned about as a pastor is that I refuse to Complain about people I don't pray for, and I pray for people I don't complain about. <laughs> Keeps my blood pressure down. <laughs> Keeps me from having issues with those people. Mm -hmm. Because if I haven't prayed for you, what right do I have to complain about you? Mm -hmm. And if I'm tempted to complain about you, why don't I go to the one who can do something with you? Because mm -hmm. I can't do anything with you. Goodbye. And so uh, that's just a little rule of thumb that I've learned that I try to practice uh, when dealing with people, um, especially as a pastor, as a shepherd. Uh, you're dealing with all kinds of people, and, 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 and some days you're not as spiritual <laughs> as you ought to be. And you got to get in your prayer closet. You know, sometimes it's right after you get through preaching a sermon. Pastor Clay gone. I need to go to the prayer closet. Because let me tell you something about pastors. And, and if, if you, any of you have taught or preached uh, or, or shared the word of God, when you're done, you're depleted spiritually. Mm -hmm. You've emptied your tank, spiritually speaking. You are vulnerable to the enemy. It is probably the most vulnerable moment for a pastor is when he's done preaching, teaching, and praying. Because you filled up the tank all week and you just emptied it. Filled. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you, 
It don't take Satan long between the time you empty to the time you get down to the office for him to mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see Pastor Clay leaving sometimes, like he's sliding down the back pole, because <laughs> I know I need not to deal with people until I can go get something first. I got other leaders who can handle that stuff. And our congregation may not understand that, but I need to understand that. Come on. I need to understand that. And sometimes they're worse than others. But you, you better understand that as a pastor. Come on. You are most vulnerable after you preach, after you've taught, and after you've prayed. Because you've emptied yourself. So I want to close out with 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, and then we'll get out of here. But it says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. If you're going to talk about men, women, boys, girls, president, senators, Republicans, Democrats, Tea Party, pastors, deacons, members, Make sure you talk about it with supplications, prayer, and intercession. Amen. That's what the text is saying. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I get the principle. I talk up, I pray for people I want to complain about. That, that's where I get that principle from. Mm -hmm. So you, you need a vibrant prayer life. And you don't always have to be on your knees. You don't always have to be in the face. There are various postures. You guys would be amazed how often I drive in my car and I get places I don't know how I got there. <laughs> Amen. Because my mind is not on the driving by the grace of God. He gets me places without running into stuff. Mm -hmm. Yet, you're paying attention somehow to the traffic flow and, and people. But really... A lot of my prayer occurs while I'm driving. Or I'm listening to a sermon that somebody's preaching and I'm, and I'm listening and I'm dissecting that thing. I'm not even paying attention to what's going on around me. Mm -hmm. Do you have that kind of focus <coughs> in prayer and in studying God's word mm -hmm. and listening to God's word? You're distracted by so many things. Mm -hmm. So who are we supposed to do this for? Verse 2, all men, but he gives the specifics. For kings, we would say to what? President. President. For all who are in authority, we would say who? Our bosses. Bosses, policemen, policemen, <laughs> policemen, <laughs> senators, <laughs> governors, mayors, church leaders. Do you pray for those people? Make a list. Mm -hmm. yeah. Make a list. Call them out by name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All who are in authority. That we, here's the result of this, this prayer, this kind of focused prayer. That we, who are believers, may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. They may mess with other folk, but they won't mess with us. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of the reasons the church is so much under attack by governing authorities is that we haven't been praying the way we should. Mm. 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 We do this so that we may live a what? Quiet mm. and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. They will let us live out our godliness, our Christian lives, and our reverence to God and won't try to interrupt it. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. I say this is a good thing to do. We're going to learn uh, in our studies, in our next study message, well, two messages in First Thessalonians, what one of the will of God is, one of God's wills for your life is sanctification. Mm -hmm. But he says another God will, another of God's will for your life is to pray. Mm -hmm. Anything that's good in the sight of God is in line with God's will. 
And he says in verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Mm -hmm. So it is God's will that we pray. Mm -hmm. If the church don't pray, who prays? <laughs> that can get through to God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the church doesn't pray. We pray to introduce the service and we pray to conclude the service and that's it. <laughs> God, you can leave after that. We done talking to you. We done hearing from you. <clears throat> we'll sing 15 songs with seven words that repeat themselves 11 times but won't pray seven times. In the service. Because y'all ready to go home. Mm -hmm. See prayer is not just mentioning your list to God. Prayer. Is conversation. With God. And conversation from God back to you. Mm -hmm. For this is good except on the sight of God our Savior. Who desires all men to be saved. And come to the knowledge of the truth. So one of the things you should be praying for is what? Mm -hmm. Salvation. Do you pray for your governing and lawyer authorities, the police department, the fire department, salvation? Mm -hmm. Or do you pray that God, well, we don't even ask God. Or do you just pray to defund them? Mm -hmm. That. The, the funding the police department don't make no sense at all. Amen. Amen. Those people have an agenda that has nothing to do with God's agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the problem is the church has jumped on board. Mm -hmm. So the intercessors aren't intercessing. The intercessors mm -hmm. are picketing and marching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Helping to defund that which has been set up by God for a specific reason. Mm. And no, they don't do it perfectly. But you don't live your Christian life per perfectly. I hope God don't defund you. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> now, he is defunding some people. That's why they got more cursing. They got blessing in their life. Mm -hmm. Because disobedience brings that. But we need to be praying. My point is, we as churches got to get back to praying. Amen. Because we are one of the hedges that God has set up to stem the flood of sin. Mm. And if the floodgates go down, mm -hmm. The storm of Katrina and all these other Ellis and all these other names they come up with takes over the city. Mm -hmm. This is why we are in the shape we're in as a nation because the floodgates have not been doing their job to restrain the floodwaters of sin mm -hmm. and disobedience. Amen. We have joined in the march. Your floodgates, your hedges. Our churches are hedges. Our Christian homes are hedges against sin. We can't join the parade of sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on. See, we don't know our role. And we're not spending time looking for his coming. Mm -hmm. And we're not praying and we're not we're not doing like Daniel confessing how we messed up. Mm -hmm. as believers in churches. It's time for us to repent so God can restore us. Let's conclude with this prayer. Father, we just thank you so much. You command us, you instruct us to pray for all men <clears throat> everywhere. To pray for our kings, our presidents, Monarchs, aristocracy, whatever the government form takes, even dictators, to pray for their salvation, to 
pray that they would come to the true knowledge of their need for a Savior. To pray that they would fulfill their God-ordained role as ministers of God. To protect those who obey the laws and to punish those who disobey the laws. So that we may live quiet and peaceful lives of godliness with all reverence. We have become so disrespectful. We slander, we malign, we talk about, we call people out their name, but we don't pray. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us, Father. I pray that the church will wake up and realize how desperately valuable and important their position is. That and for what God has established us for in this world for a temporary nothing. Being in the world but not of it. Always anticipating the soon coming of our King. But doing business on behalf of that King until he using our talents and our treasures and our temples and our testimonies and our treasures towards that end. So many of our churches have become mortuaries full of dead men's bones. Mm. Revive us again. Revive us again. Restore us, refresh us, yes. renew us, reinvigorate us yes, Lord. until your word and your will becomes like fire shut up in our bones. Yes, Lord. Help us, Father. Help us, Lord. Too. And may it start at 1916 Central Avenue and radiate and echo and reverberate throughout the community. Yes, Lord. Not so that we can build a big church, but so that your will can be done on earth. Yes, Lord. As it is in heaven. So that men from all backgrounds and women from all backgrounds and children from all backgrounds can be saved and become a part of the family of God. Yes, Lord. It's time for the church to rise up off its blessed assurance. Mm -hmm. And become the soldiers in the army of God. Marching out into our communities and marching out in our jobs and marching out in our families to proclaim the rightful rulership of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ over the lives of men and women, boys and girls. From all walks of life, from all ethnic groups, from all classes, from all cultures. Yes. Unified by the Spirit and the Word of God and the bond of peace. I pray, Father, that this will happen. Yes, Lord. It's according to your will. It's according to your purposes. Yes, Lord. Let it begin here in 1960 Central and spread. Yes, Lord. Too. Let it begin in all the BFA churches and all the SBC churches and all the other churches, Father. Mm, yes, Lord. But we must repent of our sin, of our laziness, of our compromise, of our lukewarmness, and return to our first love and put first things first. As we do this, Father, have your way. Make your name known yes, in and through us. And as you do this, we will worship you with a renewed vigor and vitality. That doesn't require manipulation and entertainment, but it's birthed by your spirit in each and every one of us. Yes, Lord. Now, as we leave this place, we <coughs> will be your presence. Yes, Lord. Be with my dear brothers and sisters as they depart. Imprint the, these thoughts upon their hearts and minds. Give them no rest and no peace until they make a commitment to line up. Pray for those who are listening by live stream that they would make the same commitment. 
Yes, Lord Jesus. And we'll give you all the honor and all the praise. And our boast will be in you and not of ourselves. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.